Good evening, everybody. Uh, great to be back again. I'm uh, Rajiv, a managing partner at Arise Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund with close to 100 startups and multiple unicorns in the portfolio. Um, a lot of action has been happening in the markets globally. Major economic economies are um, sort of tackling inflation. Energy prices continue to yo-yo. Interesting developments in the COP27 and a lot more. That's why I think we have an industry-recognized financial guru with us today. Uh, Bill, Bill Blaine is the author of the fab fabulous Morning Porridge. Uh, Bill, you need to tell us why you named it Morning, Morning Porridge. Um, he's also a strategist at uh, Shard Capital, focused on alternative investments. He's, his clients include sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, insurance and pension managers, credit funds, and family offices. Bill's uh, career spans 36 years in global markets. He has served at senior level positions at large financial institutions, including Morgan Stanley, Bear Stearns, HSBC, and BGC. Bill is a Scotsman, a sailor, and an ocean racer. As a Scotsman, he, that means basically when in England plays against any other country in the World Cup, he's likely to end up supporting which country, Bill, you, you're better advised to tell us. Right? So uh, obviously, given that the World Cup is... <laughs> playing against England, which includes <laughs> India in the cricket. <laughs> Great point. So today we'll have a conversation about a lot of interesting topics, um, one of which is what has happened in the UK that has led to Rishi Sunak being pointed to the new PM. And how the markets are performing, Bill's view on green investments, and finally, what does all of this mean for India? I'm really looking forward to this event. Um, so I'm going to let Bill take the center stage for, um, you know, for pretty much the all of this event. I'm going to sort of start to pose a few questions at him. And folks, you don't need to make any notes because we're obviously happy to make this conversation available um, after this event on social media and other channels. Um, and uh, please feel free to post your questions and answers, our Q&A, uh, you know, sort of points um, on the on the chat or wherever we'll get to them. And um, I'll, I'll be happy to sort of ask Bill on, on your behalf. I look forward to a great next 60 minutes. So, um, Bill, unless you have anything else to add to this, um, I can quickly get going. Okay, well, let me very quickly start by just telling you why I do a morning commentary called The Morning Porridge. Um, I, as you've said, uh, um, I've worked in markets for too long. And every morning I start by reading the newspapers and the financial commentaries. And I've come to the conclusion that most of the stuff that the banks produce is unreadable gibberish. It's written for compliance officers rather than investment uh, gurus. So what I did was start, and this was 15 years ago, I started writing a commentary for my clients in my own style, keeping it brief and relatively amusing, but trying to put in insights. And I thought, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to give everyone a healthy breakfast. And as a Scotsman, of course, I eat morning porridge, porridge being the best way to start your morning, a healthy breakfast. So I called it the morning porridge and it's stuck. And I now have over 10,000 subscribers all around the world. It includes some of the major market funds, but also includes many politicians, regulators, and also central bankers and an awful lot of journalists who keep telling me how wrong I am. And I think that's a good thing to be told how often you're wrong gives you direction on how to be right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, if somebody's welcome, passionate enough, sorry, yeah, go on. And I welcome anyone to look at the Morning Porridge website, www.morningporridge.com, and please read it. And if you like it, sign up. I will be absolutely delighted. Fantastic. Fantastic. And as I said, you know, if people are willing to commit on something, even if it is to say wrong, that means they're passionate about it. And that obviously is something you've raised a last passion. That's always the, the best thing to happen. So wonderful. So with that, um, I think, um, introduction, Bill, what we'll do is quickly get into the first and the most exciting question as far as I'm concerned. So how did Rishi Sunak become the president, prime minister of the UK, right? So, I mean, um, our understanding from what I, where I sit is really that we had this, um, you know, we had the Bank of England sort of tightening, and then you had the earlier um, person that was on the hot seat of the UK sort of loosening. And obviously, you know, these two were working counterproductive to each other. And then suddenly you had the blow up of the pension funds and then after that you know the blow up of the parliament and the and the government happened and then suddenly rishi, rishi is in in place so that's what we know so if you could sort of get a little deeper into this entire story and sort of give us what happened uh, behind the scenes and okay. what the bank england did days, and how many days have we got to tell you the whole <laughs> story of british politics 
Okay, let me start by saying the first thing about Rishi Sunak he is he is the absolute epitome of the Anglo-Indian dream. His parents uh, were a pharmacist and a GP in Southampton. Now I'm engaged in that because I happen to live near Southampton. My passion is sailing. I keep my boat down in a place called Hamble, right next door to Southampton. But Rishi's parents obviously did what so many Anglo-Indian parents do. They brought their children up extremely well, ensured that they got good educations, uh, and Rishi himself went to some of the best schools in the south of England. He did extremely well, went to Oxford, where he got a very good degree, then went to Goldman Sachs, where after a year, he went off to do his MBA. And that's when the critical thing happened to Rishi Sunak. In 2009, he married the daughter of Narayan Murthy, as you know, one of the richest Indian billionaires. Now, I'm not for one second suggesting that access to all that uh, cash changed his approach, but it's fair to say that after he married the billionaire's daughter, Rishi Sunak was able to open up his own hedge fund and also become a partner in Murthy's hedge fund as well. And in 2015, out of nowhere, he appeared as a Conservative Party candidate standing for one of the safest seats in the UK in Yorkshire. Yorkshire is not exactly known for being the most um, welcoming to immigrants places in the UK, but apparently he's an extremely popular MP amongst his constituents around the very wealthy town of Richmond. And him and his wife and his two daughters have done extremely well as part of Yorkshire society. Now, because of his background in finance, having worked for Goldman Sachs and also in hedge funds, he was very quickly, after he became a Conservative MP in the David Cameron government, he was very quickly put into the Treasury. But during the Brexit vote, he supported leaving. This was the UK leaving the European Union. He was a Brexiteer. He was keen that the UK leave to take advantage of all the opportunities that haven't yet become apparent. And when David Cameron's government collapsed in 2016, um, he then uh, got more involved in a junior treasury position. Um, in 2018, I think it was uh, another Asian gentleman, uh, Sajid Javid, became the UK's first um, Chancellor of the Exchequer from the subcontinent. And he then was Boris Johnson's first Chancellor. Now, when Boris Johnson's uh, henchman, a guy called Dominic Cummings, his enforcer, insisted that Javi gave up all his advisors, which incidentally included myself, um, Javid resigned. And at that point, the relatively unknown Rishi Sunak took over as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now, he came in like a breath of fresh air and very quickly got the nickname Dishi Rishi, because for the first time ever, we actually have a good looking, attractive, sportsmanlike looking Chancellor. The rule had always been that Chancellors were big, dumpy old men who looked pretty bad. But Rishi Sunak came in with an air of energy about him. And that very quickly became clear in 2020 when the pandemic hit and Britain went into COVID lockdown, where Rishi Sunak gets the credit for very quickly pumping money into the economy through a furlough scheme that kept workers employed and also handing out billions of sterling to keep companies afloat. Now, the response to COVID in the UK was not perfect. Now, an awful lot of money was squandered on medical orders that weren't fit for purpose, and an awful lot of the money that was given to corporates has been lost to fraud, but it did keep the economy going rather effectively. And there was very quickly talk that Rishi Sunak was going to become a contender to eventually become leader of the Conservative parties. Now, at that point, we had the inimitable, the excellently amusing, but not very competent, Boris Johnson as the UK Prime Minister. Now, Boris got himself into a whole number of scrapes. 
He was caught, even though he put the whole country into lockdown, promising terrible penalties to anyone who met up with anyone else, he oversaw a party atmosphere in Downing Street, the heart of UK government. And eventually when that story broke, it became very clear that Boris had been partying with an air of entitlement that did not go down well with the country. In fact, both Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak were both found guilty of breaking the COVID rules and both of them were fined. I think they were fairly insignificant fines, about 50 quid or something, but both of them then got a record. Eventually, Boris was forced to resign and there was a leadership uh, contest within the Conservative Party to determine who would be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. That happened earlier this year and it ended up being a vote between Rishi Sunak, who was supported by the majority of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, and a lady called Liz Truss. Now, Liz Truss has had a whole variety of jobs in government. Uh, she's been a uh, foreign secretary. She's been in charge of the Home Office, which guards our immigration and our borders. Uh, and she's never made much of an impact on the UK in the way that Rishi did. But she does have the support of many of the elderly, generally white and well off uh, members of the Conservative Party. So she won the election. But instead of bringing in somebody with great competency into the chancellor role, which is the most important role in UK government, because that's where the money gets spent, she brought in a good friend, uh, a guy called Quasi Quartain, who immediately announced that he was going to have a growth budget. He then announced the budget, but did nothing to take advice from either the Bank of England, the UK's Office for Budget Responsibility, the Debt Management Office, or even talking to the Bank of England about what would be the best way to put it together. The markets reacted terribly. The result was that sterling crashed, we saw the gilts market, which is the UK's bond market, government bond market, tumble overnight. That's uh, sparked a crisis for UK pension funds because what they'd been doing was investing a lot of their money in UK gilts, which are absolutely safe. But then they were leveraging these gilts through a number of financial transactions. And the result was that the derivatives involved in these transactions meant that the trades were all losing money, creating a mark to market issue, and also that they would have to post margin on that mark to market issue. As a result, a lot of the largest pension fund providers, what we call the real money accounts, found that they needed to meet the margin calls and the only assets they could sell in a crashing market were gilts meaning they were selling gilt into a gilt crash, which simply exacerbated the problem. And this was all kicked off by the gross incompetence of the Conservative government in that mini budget. The Bank of England stepped in, rescued the situation. The new Prime Minister, Liz Trust, eventually admitted that she was wrong, but it was too late. She was forced to resign and we had a new election. And that basically boiled down to Rishi Sunak then being crowned as the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Now, I'm going to give Rishi great credit for being entirely competent. He's 100% better than Liz Truss and much better than Boris Johnson. But the problem he has is that Rishi has only now been in power for a couple of weeks. The Conservative government that he leads has been in power for 12 years. And during that 12 years, we've seen an enormous deterioration in the UK's terms of trade. The UK has grown slowly. We have not seen any significant productivity gains, meaning that our economy has had to borrow more and more simply to keep on path. And our whole service-driven economy is not succeeding by uh, exports, but succeeding simply by borrowing more and more money from abroad, that is clearly unsustainable. The result is that Rishi Sunak was forced to announce what we call an austerity budget. That's going to result in the UK 
being one of the worst performing G10 economies. And that's going to be very significant in terms of the uh, future inwards investment to the UK. Now, it's not that the UK is not a successful country. We certainly are. In terms of invention and innovation, we're one of the leaders when it comes to winning Nobel Prizes and coming up with some of the devices like personal computing, the internet, medical science, you name it, the UK has done very well. And of course, we exert enormous soft power around the globe. All you need to do is look how successfully our dear Queen's funeral was handled just a few months ago. There is no other country in the world that could have done that so successfully. Yet, the UK now finds itself in a terrible dilemma. Growth is going to be limited. And why is that? Well, one of the key reasons is Brexit. The fact that we voted for self-economic suicide by pulling out of Europe. Now, I'll admit, I was convinced as well. I thought Brexit would be good because Europe is essentially bureaucratic. But in order for Brexit to succeed, we very quickly have to trade with the rest of the world. And as I'm sure you're all aware in India, we've been trying for five years to sign a new trade deal with India, and it simply doesn't look like happening quickly enough. Now, going back to Rishi Sunak, because I know that's what you're all interested in, Rishi is in a very difficult place. After 12 years, the UK has done anything but grow. The Conservative government has left many people worse off. We have galloping inflation because of the energy crisis kicked off by the Ukraine war. The whole of Europe is overly reliant on Russian oil and gas for energy. That's a terrible mistake to make. One of the most important things any economy should do should ensure its energy security. Europe failed to do that, and so did the UK. We're now paying the consequences of that, um, but I'm pretty convinced that we will sort things out. But in the short term, everyone is blaming the Conservative government. That government only has two years to run until the next elections, and at the moment, it does look like no matter how successful and popular Rishi Sunak is on a personal level, the Conservatives will get replaced by a new Labour government sometime in the next two years. That said, Rishi Sunak is coming across very well. And I think there are enormous opportunities that I'm sure we'll discuss in this chat that will result as a result of Rishi Sunak being a figurehead. But I think one of the things I would like to emphasize is that I very much doubt any of us would ever have heard of Rishi Sunak if it wasn't for the fact of who his father-in-law is and has clearly financed him into his position. That's a, that's a very comprehensive uh, point of view, Bill, and I think it was very neutral as well. So I just love the way you sort of articulated and how things work. Um, uh, I think one of the questions that I have as a consequence of that is, look, it seems to me that there seems to be a dichotomy between how the first world nations are behaving, right, and how some of the emerging world nations are now starting to behave, right? If I look at um, the US, inflation rates are at eight, eight and a half. I think the UK is at 10. Europe is also at some nine and a half, 10. You know, you've got uh, other geographies also so that's sort of not done very well. And, you know, they've seen significant drawdowns in their markets, right, both in the bond markets and the stock markets, right? Um, and, of course, the DXY has sort of been exploding off the scales. It's come down a little bit, but it's still sort of out there. On the other hand, if you look at some of the emerging markets, and I'm India is obviously one of those, but there is also, you know, Indonesia, there is also, you know, there's also Mexico. Some of these guys have not just, you know, not held up, you know, in terms of, you know, what's happened to their markets and all. They seem to sort of be doing things very differently. India, for instance, has got an inflation rate as, which is at about six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent, which is sort of less than what it is in the first world. I mean, imagine this, we are behaving like a first world economy and the first world is behaving like an emerging market economy. So what do you think is exactly happening here? What is your sense of uh, what's, why there is this dichotomy between these two, you know, sort of, you know, uh, ecosystems per se? Well, I think we need to go back to 2008, the global financial crisis for the roots of the new financial crisis and the likely global recession that we're going to experience in 2023. Um, that basically boils down to governments in the Occidental, the Western economies, all embracing quantitative easing and ultra low interest rates. And the big threat that we all perceived at the beginning was, 
if you're simply pumping money into economies by buying back bonds mm -hmm. and reducing interest rates, therefore making money cheaper, all you're going to do is create inflation. But we never saw that inflation. And there are really two reasons for that. First of all, instead of that money that was being pumped into the financial sector going into the real economy, which was what the plan had been, we actually saw most of that money pumped into financial assets. And if you look at the stock markets and bond markets of all the occidental economies since 2008, they've all rallied spectacularly. And the reason for that is if you sent, set the risk-free government bond rate at zero, every other financial asset prices off that. So we know that corporate bonds are much more risky than government bonds, so they set higher. But if you set, if government bonds were 5% and then you set them at zero and corporate bonds were 10%, they now fall to 5%, which doesn't reflect the risk. And 5% isn't a high enough return for that risk. So you take even more risk by buying stocks, equities instead. The result was 10 years of massive market rallies and everything becoming distorted. And the second thing that was going on, of course, was that China was the global center for cheapest to produce. And effectively, since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2002, it's been exporting deflation around the world. And a third factor, of course, was supply chains, all predicated on supply from uh, Southeast Asia and China. When all these things broke down, during COVID, we very quickly saw that inflation became very real when China stopped supplying and supply chains broke down. And following that, we've had this energy crisis as a result of the Ukraine war right across the Occidental economies. And that's been the major trigger for inflation, energy prices spiking, then you add into that the normalization of markets that suddenly all this inflation that occurred in financial asset prices is now loose in the more general market. And you've got China stopping being an exporter of deflation. And suddenly you have this massive crisis in the West developing. We've realized that all we've done is ramped up borrowing to find, you know, we've been spending today for stuff we're going to pay for tomorrow. And that's why the, uh, the Western economies have been in such trouble suddenly. Now, there are ways to address it. Austerity is probably not the best way because we know we're heading into recession. In time, the energy shock will lessen. But because prices have gone up so quickly, you now have real inflation. Now, real inflation is not asset price inflation, that's where you get wage-driven inflation. So across the Western economies, we have workers demanding higher pay, and if they don't get it, you get industrial strife, and the economy starts to collapse. So here in the UK, for the first time ever, we have nurses in the hospitals threatening to go and strike unless they get a fair pay award. I have great sympathy for them. They deserve to be paid properly. We also have the railways all on strike because they're being underpaid. The private sector is typically paying its staff more. Public sector workers, which is a large part of the UK and across Europe, are also wanting paid more. Now, the effect of this is less in the United States because, of course, the US is basically energy self-sufficient. So they've not had the same energy crisis that we're having in Europe and the UK. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing this um, lesser effect of inflation across the emerging economies. But there's another thing that's going on as well that I think needs to be commented on, and that is uh, the sense that we see around the globe of nations feeling confident to go their own way geopolitically. When Russia invaded Ukraine, in the West, we saw that as completely unacceptable. The whole West very quickly ganged up against Russia. We imposed sanctions. And we were shocked when countries in the Middle East and India turned around and didn't support us. That was a clear message that nations like India, which has now overtaken the UK, 
in terms of uh, GDP are now going their own way. And that's a good reason we need to be paying more attention to what's going on in these nations. Now, there are some that I think are eventually going to regret it, the way that Saudi Arabia has performed, has behaved, linking very closely to Russia. There will be a cost for that. But I think it's made people in the West realize that we need to deal with nations like India on a very different basis. We can no longer be telling them what to think. We need to be listening to why they think the way they do. Great, great, uh, great thesis. And I think you you laid out a very articulate point of view on why, you know, or these uh, these blocks have behaved slightly differently. You brought up China a few times, so I'm going to sort of you know quiz you a little bit on China because China is the number two economy, and it is the as you said the biggest um, you know puller down of inflation in the planet for the last 10, 15 years. So once it starts firing again, presumably inflation is going to be down. In any case, you know I think the last uh, two months have seen a significant drop off in inflation as well. Do you think that's going to continue to happen? What do you think is happening in China in terms of the COVID lockdowns, and where is the where is the story headed? When are we going to see uh, full blast China back on in the world economy again? Okay, let me start off by saying that I have got China wrong in the past. Uh, a couple of, uh, a number of years ago, I decided China was going to be a fantastic investment opportunity, and I did what any Scotsman would do, which is invest in future growth. That's where we made all our money. Remember, the Hong Kong, HSBC, some people think it stands for the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Nonsense. It stands for the home for Scottish bank clerks because <laughs> Scotsmen are naturally outward going. So we were the guys that founded Hong Kong in 1843 on the basis of doing trade with China. So just a few years ago, I followed that well-worn path and thought, I love the way that China is developing. This is a great place to put money. So I invested in a whole series of the large stocks and also funds that were investing in China. And you know what? My timing absolutely sucked. That was about the time that uh, Z, President Z decided to discipline entrepreneurs and force them to back the government. And then we've seen this increasing geopolitical tension between the US and China, which has come to something of a head. Then, of course, we see the breakdown in supply chains during COVID. We see China sticking to the very intense uh, COVID uh, path, which has slowed down the reopening of the economy. It's been, I think, a bit of a gift for India, because if I look at where the next Foxconn is going to be, it's going to be in India, you know, because production is going to move from a place that we distrust fundamentally to a place where we think you think of pretty much the same way we do. India will be the beneficiary of a lot of the supply chains that will move out of China. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the almost wage slavery that we've seen these big uh, Chinese production facilities be. Um, I am unconvinced that China is simply going to slot back in to the same place it was in in the global economy. I think you will see China emerge as an important economic and geopolitical power, but not in the way we expect. The first thing there is that China has become a surveillance state. I think the Chinese are very happy with how they've handled COVID, not in terms of closing the economy clearly, but I am told, because I've not been to China since COVID started, that you cannot do anything in China without your phone giving you a green light because you need that green light to go into any shop or any office or anywhere. If your phone has a red light on it, you are stopped and you're going to end up in a COVID hotel. It's basically a way of stopping any gatherings or any kind of uh, complaint. We are hearing there's been riots in some of the iPhone production uh, plants, but I suspect that's very limited. The Chinese government now has much stronger control over its populace than before. They will still continue to deliver what we call the iron rice bowl, which is a promise of economic prosperity and jobs in return for supporting the Chinese Communist Party. But it's very much going back to a uh, state command control economy. The idea of entrepreneurs driving the success of a future tech 
uh, based economy in China, I don't think is going to happen because that relied on so much um, intellectual property being liberated, liberated from the West. And that is not simply, that is not going to happen again. So I think we're going to see a diversion uh, between a divergence between where uh, Chinese technology goes and where the technology of the West goes. Now, that's an opportunity for other nations not only to become the production powerhouse, but also the innovation powerhouse that to continue the development of Western tech. So I see China playing a different role. And it's also, I don't see any swift end to the geopolitical tensions. Um, I think there will ease. I think we'll see Biden and Xi have a proper summit at some time soon to try and get trade going again. But the suspicion between the two great nations is going to be there. I characterize it almost, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's that empire moment. I'm not worried at all about Russia. Russia is a busted flush. It's an old economy. It's technologically backward. Russian GDP is 12,000 per annum compared to 50,000 per annum across the rest of Europe. There are 149 million aged Russians. Their armed forces have been decisively beaten in Ukraine. They are not a threat to the West. China, well, we don't know. They, though, look much more competent than Russia is. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. Fabulous, fabulous. And I, I, I think uh, the point you're making about the fact that China can't just slot itself back in, you know, I think is a valid point, particularly given two or three things. One is really that India has had, uh, you know, huge resurgence thanks to the fact that we are the number two coding nation on the planet right now. We have literally got more coders in India than in any other nation except in America. And 50% of the Americans that do coding anyway are Indians anyway, right? So it's almost like we sort of have the single biggest oil ecosystem in the planet right now with, uh, you know, technology and code base as a, as a story. Right. So absolutely, I think uh, that's something that's there. Uh, uh, switching gears a little bit, I think um, uh, given the price of energy and what's happening right now, and the last year has been an amazing year um, for coal and oil and gas, you know, in terms of consumption of those two. And um, it's not been such a wonderful year from a thought process of what's happening from a green perspective, right? So, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of the green sheen sort of come off as it were. And at the same time, you've had the COP20 seven as well so do you sort of you know can you lay out a little bit of you know given that you're from europe and europe has sort of been at the vanguard of the zeta storyline in terms of carbon credits and the only running carbon market in the planet really sits there can you sort of lay out a little bit of where this storyline goes going forward from here how big is green going to be what is your sense of where it is all right let me start off by saying i believe that renewable power climate change climate mitigation and carbon sequestration, carbon markets, they are going to be the biggest market in the next 20 years. They're going to be as big as disruptive tech has been since 2000. Uh, and the reason for that is that I absolutely believe in the science of climate change. And I absolutely believe it has to be addressed. And as we see the effects start to become more and more apparent in changing weather conditions, the onus is going to be on us to make things happen. But the thing is, markets are not particularly effective at making that happen unless it happens in conjunction with government control. The reason being that markets are always going to be focused on short term returns. Governments have got to focus on making sure they focus on the long term. So what I think we're seeing in the United States where President Biden's inflation infrastructure plan is going to create enormous subsidies into all these new green climate change industries. That's fantastic. But what we've seen so far in investment has really been very short term and also marketing focused. By that, I mean that lots of European fund managers tell me how green they are and how they're investing in renewable energy which almost invariably means all they do is they buy wind farms. Now, wind farms are easy. Anyone can open up a wind farm or a solar farm. The technology is dead simple. The problem is connecting them to the grid and making sure that the electricity grids can handle the power. But you can easily invest in a wind farm. 
And that's why the yields on wind and solar are so, so low, but they're not efficient ways of making power. Here in the UK, tidal energy would be much more efficient because every day the tide comes in and out every 12 and a half hours. Um, that could be harnessed more efficiently. We also need to be spending more on efficient nuclear power. And there are loads of other power sources that we can look at, like geothermal and, of course, hydrogen. None of these things are easy. Storing hydrogen is really difficult, and we need to build whole new technologies to do it. But none of the investment is yet going into these areas. It's going to happen, but at the moment, it's not efficient enough. The second issue is we need a clear transition. You can't just decide that overnight we're going to switch off every coal station and every gas-fired power station. It needs to happen in a planned way because you cannot build enough wind farms to do that. And you need to have a plan, which probably means using gas as a transition fuel for the next 30 years. You also need to work out how do you continue growth? Because we cannot have that transition unless we get growth. And this is very pertinent for all the emerging and developing nations. Why should they be denied growth unless we have something for them? So we need to be able to encourage them to still grow, but grow using clean, renewable power. And that probably needs assistance to do. So one of the things we're doing within my own firm, Shard Capital, is we're investing lots in trying to build solar power in areas that solar power does work. We're building something in Egypt just now, and we're going to try and look for opportunities to do the same thing in India as well. So if anyone listening is wanting to finance renewable energy, please get in touch on it. Uh, but there needs to be a better plan uh, for this transition. If we simply rely on coal, we're going to have what we've had this year, which is an actual increase in emissions rather than emissions coming down. But I'm absolutely convinced in the future we're going to see successful mitigation strategies come in because basically human beings are very innovative creatures. Eventually, when we realize we have a problem, we address it and we sort it and we solve it. And I'm pretty sure that's what will happen eventually. Great. I think uh, that's a very um, uplifting message. Thanks, Bill. Uh, the last couple of questions, really. The first one is really India has now sort of taken over the G20 membership. Uh, we are now um, sort of, you know, going to host a bunch of events in India over the next uh, year or so, culminating in the November big jamboree where uh, pretty much everybody who's anybody is going to be here and sort of, you know, there's going to be a big uh, talk fest that's going to happen. Given all of this that's happening and given the fact that um, obviously we have started to do our own things yet, I mean, put very inimitably by you, but nevertheless, we've started to do our own things right now. What do you think we should be thinking about as India, you know, when we deal with the rest of the world? Uh, you, you could perhaps look at this from a framework of how the UK and India should deal with each other to sort of put a, maybe a roadmap together for how we can think about this, perhaps, you know, looking at it from your perspective. Right. I think you've already hit one of the key things there, which is India's skill sets. Uh, as you say, there are more coders in India than practically anywhere else. Um, so that's definitely something because the world is not going to stop needing new tech and tech will continue to develop. There are some major advances coming on that are going to change the world. I'm fascinated by quantum computing because that is going to change absolutely the way we do everything. Um, but we need to find better ways of working together. Uh, if I can put on my view from the UK here, we do find it quite difficult to deal with Indians because uh, we had a very simple rule that was uh, put in place by one of my colleagues, uh, Pradipta Bhattacharya, who's one of my best friends. He's a nuclear scientist who ended up working for CERN. These were the guys who built the Large Hadron Collider. When they eventually fired it up and it didn't destroy the world, he was so disappointed that he decided he'd try to destroy the world by joining the financial world. And he ended up coming to work for me at HSBC. And he's been working with me for years, but Prodi came up with the Bhattacharya rule, which is when you deal with Indians, hold them by the scruff of the neck because they will always want 100% of the deal instead of the 50-50 that you agreed at the start. So I think there needs to be some very clear 
uh, understandings whenever you're trying to do business between the UK and India, that it's a 50-50 effort on both sides. There are concerns about corruption and especially bureaucratic corruption, uh, which is something that we often find whenever you're trying to deal in emerging markets, that people want backhanders. But being able to pe speak to people who speak good English and understand English business ways or American Anglo-American ways of doing business is a great advantage. So I am far keener on trying to do business with Indians who I think I understand rather than trying to do business with Chinese who I know I don't understand. <laughs> I think there's a fundamental difference. I can talk to you, Ranji. I find it very difficult when I've got somebody who's trying to play my job against me in my head. <laughs> so um, that said, the opportunities for India are legion. Um, and I think the fact that India is now, I think already the most populous nation in the world is very interesting because ultimately, everything is going to boil down to demographics. Across Europe, we have declining demographics, and that is creating many problems already, uh, especially in care for the elderly. Um, that's not just in providing people to look after them, but also working out how to do that most effectively from a technological perspective. There are all kinds of medical science businesses about how to ensure that the elderly have better lifestyles and better care. It's not just putting people in place to look after them, it's far more complex than that. It's about the way you run medicine and the way you create wealth within societies. And I think there's a great opportunity uh, for the UK and India to work together on that. Uh, the, the success of Rishi Sunak is important here as well. If we look in the UK, the most successful immigrant uh, caste in the UK are Anglo-Indians. They tend to do extremely well because they focus on educating their children who then go into professional jobs. And across the city of London and across the British media, Indians are far better represented than any other ethnic group. And there's a reason for that. You work hard. There's no reason why we shouldn't see more cross-fertilization between the economies. Now, there's a lot of talk in the UK about we can't have more immigrants, we can't bring in more people because the country is already full. That's absolutely nonsense. The country is not full at all. And if you look at the success of the UK, it has been through waves of successive immigration, uh, right the way from the Romans coming to conquer us 2,000 years ago, then the Angles, and then the Normans. And if you look at uh, London, one in three people who call themselves fully bred Londoners actually have French blood from the Huguenots who fred, fled France in the 1600s because of religious persecution. I'm a Scotsman, which makes me slightly different. I'm a purebred Scotsman, you know, that's why I burn in the sun and uh, my kids have red hair and stuff. But otherwise, Britain has always been a mix of ethnicities. And within three or four generations, you become as British as we are. But I think it's fantastic that one of the first things that Rishi Sunak did when he took office was put a Diwali candle in the window of Downing Street. That was admired across the whole of the UK. We are quite proud of how welcoming we are. And um, remember that our favorite national food is Indian food. Of course, <laughs> curry and um, what is the beer that cobra, right? That's that's really the thing that cobra, curry cobra and cobra. Is <laughs> I prefer kingfisher. But <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So um, one last question. I think this has to do with investors right now. So if you were, I mean, um, as you've been advising investors for the last whatever you know, um, you know, decades or so, what would you say people need to be doing with their portfolios right now? That's going to you know sort of you know keep them you know sort of uh, in play. As well. That is the one trillion billion dollar question, isn't it? What is next year going to look like? Um, my big concern is that inflation is not beaten in the West. We still very much have real underlying inflationary pressures from wages. That is going to keep interest rates higher than I think the market expects. 
Higher interest rates are going to cause enormous problems for corporates that are reliant on overly cheap money. So I think we're going to have a series of defaults. We're going to see declining earnings in the stock market, making both of them more difficult. These are going to cause crisis for many investors who are going to find that they have to sell uh, more private assets. Now, the difficulty of private assets like property or uh, private equity or private debt is there is no liquidity in these. So you end up with liquidity risk and you also have the risk of a market slide creating a panic, which creates leverage risk as well. So I think there are still big risks in the system. But of course, as an investor, your biggest risk is missing the point when the market turns. Now, I think there's still a lot of correction from this period of quantitative easing, which so distorted markets and the prices of everything. That's still to be factored in. But inflation has the effect of drawing a heavily distorted market and too cheap money. It does tend to draw them together. So at some point, we're going to get back to normalcy. At that point, I think the global economy looks uh, very much more interesting. That said, there are enormous risks. The geopolitical ones, I think, are actually easing. I think Russia is going to be beaten in Ukraine and will be forced. We'll see that uh, situation change. I think China reads what is going on there and is going to seek an accommodation with the West and isn't going to try and um, do anything outward bound relative to Taiwan. Uh, and we then need to look at what the political risks are. In the UK, I think we've gone past peak idi idiocy, which was under Prime Minister Trump. I think Rishi Sunak is a breath of fresh air. I don't think he's going to last very long though. Our next government, I think, will be equally competent under Sir Keir Starmer of the Labour Party. I'm more worried about the United States. Although Donald Trump is unlikely to win the Republican nomination for the 2024 election, somebody very like him with the same isolationist tendencies could well win. And if that happens and the US pulls away from global markets, that's bad for global trade. And it could also open up a power vacuum if America decides to reduce its commitment to areas like NATO and its pivot towards Asia. So the world will always remain an interesting place, but if you really want to know what's going on, then you have to subscribe for the morning forage so that you can read about it every morning. Love it, love it, love it. One audience question has come up, and I think Ron DeSantis is the new Trump, is what I think you, I'm hearing you say. But nevertheless, we'll, we'll sort of look at what is going to happen in the US uh, per se. So uh, there's this question that's come up, which says basically, isn't there this question of double standards that the West is sort of showing? On the one hand, you know, you've got guys like Saudi Arabia or China who are sort of, you know, showing absolutely zero regard for, you know, uh, human, uh, human rights and so on and so forth. And because they own such, um, you know, dominating parts of the economy, obviously, you have to accommodate them, you have to sort of work with them and all that stuff, right? So, um, you know, uh, isn't that too high a price to pay for, you know, sort of, you know, uh, is cheap electronics enough for you to, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of offset the values that you hold dear? Uh, I mean, that's the important of the question, you sort of get the broad drift. Yeah, no, I, I, I get the drift. The, the, the problem is, you can be, you can always try and take moral high ground about dealing with um, dictatorships and the evil that humanity can sometimes exhibit. But the reality is sometimes you have to sup with the devil. Um, it would be very easy to say that we are no longer willing to deal with autocrats who display unacceptable behavior. But the reality is that the global economy is about energy and you need to play along. But there are always other ways of dealing with things. And if I was, say, sitting in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I have one of the largest air forces in the world, and I face a big threat from Iran, and I was to upset the guy that keeps my air force flying to the extent where he pulls the plug in all your planes, then I'd have made a major strategic error. So, you know, I, I think what goes around comes around. 
Um, but sometimes for the sake of keeping the global economy afloat, we do have to sup with the devil. Great. So I think, um, uh, you know, it's been a fairly, uh, you know, detailed chat, Bill, you know, really enjoyed the, you know, uh, the questions that I think, uh, you know, we've um, sort of asked and, you know, the answers that you've given. Um, if um, uh, before I end, I want you to sort of talk a little bit about where people can find you and your content, you know, if you want to just sort of, you know, make a small, uh, you know, sort of, you know, where can we find more about you? Yeah, well, um, first of all, if, if anyone wants to sign up for the morning porridge, I'll be delighted. If you send me an email to billblaine at morningporridge.com, you can find the Morning Porridge website quite easily on the World Wide Net. Um, I'll be more than delighted to put people on the porridge, um, give them a trial even. Um, I also am a strategist and head of alternative assets for Shard Capital. Again, you can find Shard Capital on the the net and I'll be delighted to take individual questions from people if they want to email me. Um, we do tend to have a you know fairly experienced team here. We talk through all our market moves and we do have a number of specific funds that we look at things like disruptive tech, climate change, all these aspects, credit markets, and I'll be delighted to talk about them all. Fabulous. I think I'm going to end on a very light note, um, which is basically something that uh, somebody from the audience has suggested. Given what's happening, given the fact that India is becoming bigger and bigger, is there a chance that we'll get our Kohino return back to us? <laughs> Any comments on that, Bill? <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> or is it destined to stay in the Tower of London? <laughs> Look, you don't want it back. It's the <laughs> unluckiest jewel in the world. Everyone who touches it dies horribly. Leave it where it is. <laughs> I mean, come on, we've given you the keys to Downing Street. Isn't that compensation? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> We're going to leave it at that. Thank you yeah. so much, Bill. Really been amazing and um, uh, fabulous. I uh, look forward to further such. And I'm sure um, we'll continue to hear and, you know, uh, you know, watch you and, you know, uh, you know, understand everything that's coming in the morning porridge. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Cheers. Thank you.